it's not on now. Testing one, two, three.
Good morning. The committee will come to order. Good morning, and thank you all for joining us today. As part of the committee's effort to strengthen the economy, create more jobs, and increase wages for American families by making the tax code simpler and fairer, today's hearing allows stakeholders and members of the public the opportunity to share their perspectives on tax reform and tax provisions affecting state and local governments. Several items in the tax code directly affect state and local governments. The most significant and widely known provisions include the exclusion of state and local government income from federal income tax, the itemized deduction for state and local income property and sales taxes, and various benefits for state and local bonds, and uh, special rules for state and local government employee pensions and benefits. Other provisions indirectly affect state and local governments as well, such as the exclusion for contributions to corporate capital. Over the last several years, we've heard much about how the tax code might be changed in ways that could affect state and local government activity. Some, such as President Obama, argue that exclusions, such as those for state and local bonds, and deductions, such as those for state and local taxes, inappropriately provide larger subsidies for high-income taxpayers and have advocated limiting the value of deductions and exclusions or replacing them with credits. Other tax reform proposals have also proposed significant reform of federal tax provisions that affect state and local governments. Generally, those proposals reduce the tax expenditures associated with these provisions and use the money to finance either rate reduction or higher spending. Both Democrats and Republicans, including Bowles Simpson, Domenici Rivlin, and tax reform panels appointed by President Obama and then-President George W. Bush, have offered these proposals. Because such a wide range of policymakers have concluded that, tax, that reform of tax provisions affecting state and local governments should be part of the discussion, it's critical to understand why they've come to such a conclusion. And it's equally critical to make sure the committee hears all sides of the story. Thus, in the interest of fairness, it will be important for the committee to examine how these federal tax subsidies impact individual states. For example, with regard to the deduction for state and local taxes, consider the following. In terms of the total value of deductions claimed, taxpayers in just three states, California, New York, and New Jersey, claim over 36 percent, more than one-third in 2010. These same states have some of the highest combined state and local income tax rates. California's state income tax rate is 13.3 percent, New Jersey's is 9 percent, and New York's highest combined income tax rate, which is in New York City, is 12.7 percent. Those findings and many more that have been uncovered over the years raise significant concerns about the current tax code is being used to pick winners and losers. But we're not writing a tax reform bill in some ivory tower. Changes to the tax code will have a real impact on state and local economies, and the committee needs to hear directly from these stakeholders before considering any proposals as part of comprehensive tax reform. In addition to this hearing, the committee's 11 separate working groups also serve as a way to gather information from these stakeholders about how current tax laws affect them. These reports will be important to have us as we begin to explore what changes, if any, should be considered, and I'm hopeful they will take the opportunity to share their thoughts. I'd like to thank all of you for being here today. We've assembled a panel of four witnesses, each of whom has a broad set of experiences in this area, and I'm sure they'll provide a unique perspective to the discussion, and we look forward to your, to your testimony, and I will now recognize the ranking member for the purposes of an opening statement. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, and welcome. In the 11 tax reform working groups that we set up on a bipartisan basis, based on reports to date and my own participation, we are making progress toward understanding present laws and their pluses and minuses and their possible implications for the policy challenges we face. In an important sense, the hearing today illustrates that challenge as we address tax reform. Republicans in the budget to be voted on this week have once again reaffirmed their goal of collapsing the current rate structure to two brackets with a top rate of 25 percent. An analysis by the Nonpartisan Tax Policy Center has indicated that the rate reduction and other specific ta tax policies in that budget would cost five $0.7 trillion over 10 years. Yet the budget gives no indication or any illustration as to how to address this huge gap 
most of which would involve ways and means jurisdiction. We are familiar with the President's proposal to cap deductions at 28 percent. Various proposals to limit deductions and tax preferences have been put forth in the past. I believe there is value in considering thoughtful proposals as we seek a balanced approach to deficit reduction. However, the differences of opinion in the testimony before us today on one set of tax policies, those relating to state and local government, illustrate the need to distinguish between rhetoric and reality in addressing the important issue of tax reform. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Levin. Now, it's my pleasure to welcome our panel of experts, all of whom bring a wealth of experience from a variety of perspectives. Their experience and insights will be very helpful as our committee considers the impact of federal tax reform on state and local governments. And first, I'd like to welcome Scott Hodge, president of the Tax Foundation here in Washington, D.C. Mr. Hodge has spent over two decades working in tax policy, and his organization has provided this committee with a host of valuable data and insight through the years. Second, we will hear from David Parkhurst, who joined the National Governors Association in 2007 and currently serves as director of its Economic Development and Commerce Committee. Third, we will hear from Christopher Taylor, an independent consultant who spent nearly 30 years as executive director of the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board and now works in Alexandria, Virginia as a financial consultant. And finally, we welcome back to the committee and we'll hear from John Buckley, the former chief of staff for the Joint Committee on Taxation and the former Democratic Chief Tax Counsel here at the Ways and Means Committee who's currently a professor of tax law at Georgetown University Law Center. And again, welcome back, Professor Buckley. Thank you all for being with us today. The committee has received each of your written statements, and they will be made part of the formal record. Each of you will be recognized for five minutes for your oral testimony. And Mr. Hodge, we'll begin with you. You're recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member Levin, members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to contribute to this really important discussion of fundamental tax reform. And I think as all of you recognize, one of the obvious goals of tax reform is to eliminate those parts of the tax code that have unintended side effects that outweigh whatever sort of policy reasons motivated their original creation. At the top of this list, actually, should be the various tax provisions benefiting state and local governments. In the same way that a mortgage interest deduction may encourage some families to purchase a more expensive home than they would otherwise afford, the taxes paid deduction and municipal bond exemptions encourage many states to tax more, spend more, and borrow more than they otherwise would. Academic research indicates that the taxes paid deduction leads to greater reliance on tax deductible taxes, such as the progressive income taxes and property taxes, and ultimately leads to increases in state and local spending of own source revenues. The states with the largest amounts of taxes paid deductions currently spend $2,800 more per capita on average than states with lower amounts of those deductions. The taxes paid deduction not only benefits higher income individuals, but it also tends to benefit the wealthiest states. The wealthiest states such as New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Virginia all have among the highest percentages of filers claiming the state tax deduction. Meanwhile, the poorest states such as Arkansas, Mississippi, New Mexico, West Virginia all have among the lowest and fewest percentage of filers claiming the deduction. Is it fair to have a tax deduction that gives the biggest benefit to the wealthiest states? As far as individuals, I think we all know that claim, those claiming the taxes paid deduction, 88% of the benefits of that deduction go to taxpayers earning over $100,000 a year. Does that seem fair? Now let's turn to the debt question. Uh, in recent years, local governments have taken on an enormous amount of new debt which now does not seem to be financing a lot of new investment. In fact, since year 2000, state and local debt has increased by 152 uh, percent, increasing from roughly $1.2 trillion to nearly $3 trillion. And meanwhile, state and local investment has ha grown hardly at all after adjusting for inflation. So we have to ask ourselves, where is all of that borrowed money gone? The municipal bond exemption may not be the sole cause of all of that new borrowing, but the availability of this cheap source of financing does create a moral hazard 
that can only be cured by eliminating the, the uh, exemption. Now the question is, what would be the economic effects of eliminating the taxes paid deduction and the municipal bond exemption? We use the Tax Foundation's tax simulation and macroeconomic model to answer this question in two different ways. We ran two scenarios. In the first scenario, we eliminated the taxes paid deduction and used all of the increased revenues for deficit reduction. The model showed that the, this sort of revenue raising plan would reduce the long-term level of GDP by 0.23%. It would reduce private business stocks by 0.45 percent, and it would reduce wages slightly. Now, these are not major economic effects, I understand, but this sort of policy would redu reduce GDP by one dollar for every one dollar of tax revenues it would raise. And we have to question whether that's worth the trade-off. Now, in the second scenario, we modeled a revenue neutral plan uh, that eliminated the taxes paid deduction and the municipal bond exemption going forward while lowering tax rates across the board. And we found that it had a very positive impact on the economy. It would boost future level of GDP by, by 0.26%, or about $41 billion. Not a huge effect, admittedly, but it would boost private business investment and wages as well, and enough to create about 240,000 new jobs. Well, in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I applaud the committee for uh, taking on this, this uh, very challenging effort of uh, reforming the tax code. And I think we all know that the defenders of these kinds of provisions will put enormous pressure on members of Congress to uh, save them from reform, as was done successfully in 1986. However, the economic evidence is very clear that these provisions produce more harmful effects than benefits. They encourage higher taxes, higher spending, and more debt at the state and local level. And our simulations show that eliminating these provisions while uh, lowering tax rates across the board would lead to higher GDP, higher private investment, higher wages, and better living standards for all Americans. I appreciate this opportunity, and I welcome any questions you might have. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Hodge. Mr. Uh, Parkhurst, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Kemp, Ranking Member Levin, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting testimony from the National Governors Association which is the only bipartisan organization of the nation's governors. My name is David Parkhurst, and I direct NGA's Economic Development and Commerce Committee, led by Pennsylvania Governor Tom Corbett and Kentucky Governor Steve Bashir. Governors last year appointed a five-member task reform task force, co-chaired by Governors Corbett and Bashir, to explore the possible effects of federal tax reforms on the states. Other members of the uh, task force included Connecticut Governor Malloy, Michigan Governor Schneider, and U.S. Virgin Island Governors DeYoung. Let me begin with a few main points. Number one, federal and state tax policies are intertwined and linked. Two, the preservation of public financing, notably tax-exempt bonds, is necessary because it is the primary method for states and local governments to raise capital for a wide range of infrastructure projects. Three, Federal laws and regulations should not increase costs to states and local governments that they incur to issue municipal debt or decrease investor appetite to purchase those uh, products. And number four, no federal law or regulation should preempt, limit, or interfere with the constitutional or statutory rights of states and local governments to develop and operate their revenue and tax streams. Tax reform, as you know, is a complex and multi-pronged issue. Changes to deductions, credits, exclusions, and exemptions in the federal code will have corresponding revenue and economic implications for the states because of the variations in each state's linkages to the federal code. In anticipation of comprehensive federal reform, the nation's governors recently released some guiding principles. They focus on federal deductibility of state and local taxes and the interest exclusion on municipal bonds because these are topics that are top priorities for all states. In addition, the principles address the broader issues of ensuring that federal reform does not limit or preempt state authority over budget and revenue systems. I want to highlight one point that I think encapsulates an important reminder. Federal tax policies and tax expenditures serve public policy purposes that aren't necessarily captured in revenue and spending numbers. To help avoid unintended consequences from federal reform, federal and state partners should work together to determine 
whether the policy benefits of a particular federal tax expenditure exceeds their budgetary costs before making final decisions. For nearly 200 years, municipal bonds have assisted states, cities, and counties finance their physical infrastructure projects. Since its inception at the beginning of the 20th century, the federal code included the exclusion for income on, for municipal bond interest. This was intentional and not a special interest add-on. Ending or capping this federal exclusion would increase the cost of financing infrastructure. Investors would demand higher yields as compensation. Higher borrowing costs would chill infrastructure investments, lead to higher taxes on citizens to cover those increased costs, or some combination. Given constraints on direct federal spending, and with the tremendous overhang of unmet infrastructure needs throughout the country, policymakers should encourage, not limit, state and local financing for those projects that create jobs and boost economic growth. Finally, every state and local government has some combination of mandatory income, sales, or property tax. Each of those combinations benefits directly or indirectly from the federal deductibility that's long been in place. Ending this federal tax deduction for state and local income and property taxes changes the rules, would effectively mean marginal tax rates increase for taxpayers, and absent an offset for equity purposes, it could create an economic drag and increase uncertainty and risk for bondholders. The message to Congress and the nation's governors is clear. We're all in this together. States and local governments as the principal owners and operators of our nation's infrastructure and issuers of municipal bonds will remain strong advocates for safeguarding municipal markets and supporting investment in infrastructure. As Congress moves forward on comprehensive tax reform, NGA looks forward to working in partnership with this committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Parkhurst. Mr. Taylor, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Levin. I am here uh, to share my observations on the municipal debt market as an economist and as a regulator of the municipal dealer community from 1978 to 2007. In particular, I want to focus my remarks uh, both in my statement and in my opening remarks on the Tax Reform Act of 1986, which fundamentally changed the municipal securities market and did so overnight. That act basically changed the groups that invested in municipal debt, and it did so in a way that destroyed the business models of many of the municipal deal members of the municipal dealer community. It changed the structure of the market, and it changed the way in which those participants in the market adapted to the new tax law. It moved the dealer community away from a model of risk-taking to one uh, that was focused on uh, obtaining fees for services. That led to a series of scandals and problems that the municipal market has wrestled with for nearly 20 years. Up to date, uh, in, 19, in the early 90s, the municipal market paid more than 250 million, the dealer community paid more than $250 million in fines for yield burning that dealt with the reinvestment of bond proceeds for municipal bonds. For members of the committee, if you make a bond tax exempt for income tax purposes, the rate at which state and local governments borrow is less than what corporations borrow because of the tax exemption. This gives state and local governments and those that serve them, the dealer community and others, the chance to invest those monies at a higher taxable rate. IRS rules regulate that and IRS rules were changed as a result and tightened supposedly as a result of the tax reform effort of 1986. Despite that, and because of the changes in the market, we ended up with two sets of scandals and major rule changes that had to be enacted by the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board to address problems in the market. The two scandals involved the reinvestment of bond proceeds, yield burning as I mentioned, uh, to fines of about $250 million, and ongoing today, an SEC, IRS, and Justice Department investigation which has led to the uh, uh, plead, uh, 13 individuals either pleading guilty or being found guilty of violating federal tax and securities laws. 
Uh, moreover, in the most recent one, to date, the fines have reached the point of $650 billion on the part of the dealer community. It raises the question uh, about tax law changes, because tax law changes change markets. Participants change their behavior. So whatever you do, please keep in mind how it's going to affect the markets and those that are participants in the market, be it state and local governments, the dealer community, or investors. Those changes can have a dark side, so I would urge all of you to think very carefully about how you go about doing that, so that these markets are not fatally damaged. We do have one of the greatest sets of infrastructure in this country. Uh, in my role as the regulator of municipal securities market, I had individuals come to my office on a regular basis from foreign countries, and their constant question is, how did you build all these roads, schools, buildings, and everything else? And most of it came out of the municipal securities market. So please uh, look at that market from a point of view of maintaining its integrity and taking steps to maintain its integrity, if at all possible. With that, I'll conclude my remarks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Taylor. Uh, Mr. Buckley, you're recognized for five minutes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Levin for the opportunity to participate in your uh, hearing today. After completion of your hearings and working group process, this committee faces a fundamental choice as to the structure of the tax reform that it will pursue. Mr. Chairman, you and your staff, the work you have done uh, outline areas of the code that need structural reform and proposing options for changes in those areas does offer one way forward. If you put your, your committee staff and the joint committee staff back to work, you could identify uh, several other similar type areas. Those areas plus the ones you've already done could be the basis for a fundamental tax reform a reform that could pass this committee, in my opinion, with bipartisan support, and a reform that would compare favorably to the 1986 tax reform. So that is one way, one way forward. The other way is to pursue a plan with dramatic rate reductions and equally dramatic repeals or curtailments of existing tax benefits. That will be a very challenging task for this committee for several reasons. First, you, unlike everybody else in this tax reform debate, have to provide the details, something that almost everybody has avoided up to this point. Second, in 1986, the Congress had the luxury of being able to eliminate rampant abusive tax sheltering to finance their rate reductions. That does not appear to be present in today's uh, situation. So to finance those rate reductions, you will have to go where the Congress was totally unwilling to go in 1986, and that is repeal or curtailment of longstanding tax benefits that are embedded in our society and in our economy. There are no tax benefits more, out, more longstanding than the exemption for interest on state and local bonds and the deduction for state and local taxes. I think the best way to explain the benefits of state and local bonds is to simply look at how they've been used. Uh, most tax exempt bonds are borrowing for public infrastructure. Private activity bonds where there is a private business use are a relatively small part of the market. In the past decade, decade, tax-exempt bonds have financed $1.65 trillion of new infrastructure investment with very small cost to the federal government. A third of that infrastructure investment was primary and secondary school construction. Repealing the exclusion will simply increase the cost of capital for state and local governments, reducing investments in infrastructure. It is that simple to pretend that there are benefits from reduction in infrastructure spending, I think is just demonstrably wrong. There, we have underinvested in our public infrastructure and there are observable economic costs on account of that underinvestment. Tax reform should not make that problem worse. 
you also should recognize the impact of tax reform on state and local governments. Re repealing the deduction for state and local taxes will increase the burden of those taxes and make it more difficult for state and local governments to finance basic governmental services. In the case of the deduction for real property taxes, I think the committee also has to be concerned about the impact of collateral consequences. Most people believe that the value of the mortgage interest deduction and the value of the deduction for state and local real property taxes is embedded in the price of our homes. Repealing those benefits could put further pressure on home values. Studies have indicated it will lead to further real declines in home values, threatening our already too slow uh, economic recovery. Mr. Chairman, these issues were debated at great length in the process of debating the 1986 Tax Reform Act. Substantial changes to these benefits were rejected in 1986, and I believe the reasons for that rejection remain valid today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Buckley. And now we'll go to questions. Um, Mr. Hodge, you stated that eliminating the federal tax breaks for state and local taxes and bonds and, and using that revenue to reduce rates across the board would actually create nearly a quarter of a million jobs in America. Uh, given the stubbornly high levels of unemployment uh, that we've seen and we continue to face after several years after the financial crisis, I, I, could you explain for the committee the economics behind why that trade-off would result in significant uh, job gains? Uh, sure. Uh, well, what this uh, uh, sort of reform would do, and this is a revenue neutral reform in which the proceeds from eliminating those deductions would go directly toward uh, across the board rate reductions. And in our model, we, it would allow all rates to be reduced by uh, about 5 percent, not 5 percent points, but 5 percent. But that's enough to spur a lot of ac new economic activity, uh, either, through, um, uh, either through direct spending on the part of the taxpayers or through new investment. And uh, by lowering the cost of capital, uh, we would see a considerable amount of new investment in the economy, uh, which ultimately uh, leads to uh, increased wages and increased jobs. Uh, these, uh, these sorts of uh, effects don't happen overnight, but they do happen over time. And um, I think that's the critical point, is to look at the long-term horizon of what the economy will look like once the reform is fully in place and fully working its way through the economy. Also, um, I mentioned in my opening statement that three states are responsible for more than a third, almost 40 percent, of the total federal deduction for state and local taxes. And they coincidentally happen to be the three states that also have the <coughs> highest combined state and local income tax rates yeah. in the country. Um, does the state and local tax deduction, as some economists have claimed, uh, does that really encourage bigger government at the state level, in your opinion? Uh, the research is, is pretty clear that there is, a, there is a direct linkage between the state and local tax deduction and higher taxes, certain types of taxes at the state level, particularly those that are deductible, those of being uh, progressive income taxes and property taxes. And a number of states have, as you, you indicate, have um, uh, dramatically increased those particular types of taxes. Uh, California has the highest uh, state income tax, uh, personal income tax. New York has some of the highest property taxes in the nation. And so th those are the kind of taxes that are not only deductible, but then are more easily increased by state and local officials because they know that Washington's going to pick up as much as one-third of the tab through the state and local deduction. All right. I have a question for everyone on the panel, if you could answer briefly. Uh, do you believe, and I'll start with you, Mr. Hodge, do you believe there's a policy difference between the federal subsidies for government bonds, which obviously are used for a public purpose, and private activity bonds, which benefits private parties? Well, I, I would eliminate both, uh, <coughs> Mr. Chairman. I, I, I don't think it's the proper role of the federal government to subsidize either one of those. And essentially, what the, those policies are doing is saying that it's more important to build a sports stadium or uh, some other uh, public uh, um, uh, infrastructure than to build a private R&D facility. And I think that uh, the tax code should be neutral to those kinds of decisions. All right, Mr. Parkhurst. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the vast majority of tax-exempt bonds, whether they're, in this case, private activity bonds, where you have a uh, uh, public wrap, or it's a, uh, a clear uh, tax-exempt bond issued by a state or local, uh, it's usually used for financing traditional purposes. It's, it's helping with government uh, schools, roads, sewer systems, public power, airport, and uh, other infrastructure. Uh, it's interesting. I'd say that some of the uh, examples we've seen recently in the media, I think, were uh, addressing projects financed under you know, special temporary authorities that were granted by Congress uh, following natural disasters uh, and, and other events like Hurricane Katrina or 9-11. And, and the authority of those uh, bonds have uh, largely expired. Uh, and I think that private activity bonds uh, uh, really do help focus in some areas around low-income housing and uh, do help uh, in certain particular areas. All right, Mr. Taylor. Uh, your microphone, I think you have to. I, I certainly believe that if you're going to give a benefit, and that's a decision the committee has to make, if you're going to give a benefit to, to the state and local government sector, limit it to true public purposes. I do not see a reason to, uh, for the same reasons that I've heard to my right, see any reason to give any kind of public benefit to private corporations or private decision makers. Um, I would probably go very strongly in favor of very sharply limiting even the public purposes that are out there. Uh, Mr. Parkhurst mentioned uh, airports and uh, uh, public power. I'm not sure, quite frankly, that you could have a good reason for doing either of those as a true public purpose. Limited to roads, sewers, and those things that local governments and state governments do, not stuff that can be substituted by a private corporation. All right. Mr. Buckley. Well, first of all, I would say that most tax-exempt bonds <coughs> are general obligation, traditional government financing of infrastructure. There are, you know, the, the term private activity bond picks up a whole ride, wide range of activities, some of which I think have big public benefit docks, wharves, airports. They're, these are transportation facilities that are necessary for our economy. There are public purposes involved, and therefore I think it's appropriate to have private activity bond financing for that type of thing. But if this committee is going to look at anything in this area, I, I would suggest they would look at the, the private activity bond rules. But let me firmly agree with the prior statement the abuses that were outlined in that New York Times article are largely because of one-time disaster-related relief, and I would hope the Congress would not repeat that in the future. Well, the New York Times article um, talked about the winery in North Carolina, the golf resort in Puerto Rico, the Corvette Museum in Kentucky, Obviously, the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, as well as the Goldman Sachs and Bank of America towers in, or buildings in New York City. But my, my question is, if those aren't appropriate for federalized, federally subsidized borrowing, are there any rules that we might change to help prevent those activities? You sort of touched on that, Mr. Buckley. Um, just quickly, if you each want to respond, if you, you think there's any I mean, obviously, some have said prevent that activity altogether and narrowly focus. Um, any other comments, Mr. Parkhurst or Mr. Taylor? I, I'd associate my remarks with uh, uh, Mr. Buckley here. Uh, I think that that's it's an opportunity to, to obviously uh, correct anomalies, to look very carefully at uh, how uh, uh, private activity bonds are, are used and make certain that uh, the uh, private portion is a de minimis uh, amount and that, indeed, private activity bonds are used for a, a public purpose. I think we've had this discussion over the years uh, around the use of eminent domain, and uh, the court had been uh, very clear in how that uh, issue was resolved. Uh, while state and locals may have uh, uh, won in uh, uh, the court, the uh, uh, court of public opinion, I think, led to some uh, uh, further discussion on that issue, and I think we'll have a similar discussion going forward with private activity bonds. Mr. Taylor. Mr. Chairman, if you're going to confer a subsidy or a benefit or something to a state and local government, they should be actively involved and the only ones involved in that activity in terms of either using their taxing power, general obligations, raising sewer fees, whatever it is. But the minute you allow a melding of those things, then I think you, you open the door to potential abuses, both in terms of the amount of issuance that's out there and also about how the funds are subsequently used and invested. Okay. 
All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Levin is recognized. Thank you. <clears throat> no, I agree we should uh, look at private activity bonds. Uh, remembering they're a small portion of the bonding that's going on. And I would hope, though it isn't clear within the jurisdiction of which of the working groups, Mr. Chairman, I would hope that the uh, working this, groups. This working group. Well, but, but also I think we need, I, I think the testimony today shows the need for uh, much further inquiry into this issue. Uh, because, Mr. Hodge, I very much agree, at least with what you say at the beginning. I don't agree with uh, other parts of it, perhaps. But when you say, contrary to conventional wisdom, not every tax expenditure is a loophole, uh, that's really correct. And I think in this discussion of tax reform, we need to press people when they say, let's resolve these huge gaps by looking at loopholes, we need to press them what they mean by that. Because I think the issues before us today are not loopholes. There are loopholes. But these are policies that have been embedded in our tax code for a long time. Uh, by the way, uh, Mr. Hodge, the Tax Foundation is a, is a nonpartisan uh, entity, how is it financed? We're entirely uh, privately financed. We're a nonprofit. We're a loophole uh, for people who want to avoid taxation by giving us a, uh, a charitable contribution. And but if the I would funders aren't public, right? I'm sorry? The, 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 the funders to your foundation aren't public. They're private individuals. We accept no government funds. And, and it comes from individuals Corporations? Private foundations. Private foundations. Um, okay, Mr. Parkhurst, um, your testimony um, was approved by the association? Yes, Congressman. So you're speaking on behalf of all the governors, Republicans, Democrats? NGA is a bipartisan organization of the nation's governors, correct. And, and when you testify, there's some clearance process. So when you speak on behalf of governors, it's something that uh, is uh, appropriately said? Yes, there is. Uh, because I, I think that's important. There's a pointing here to three states that receive a substantial portion of the, uh, of the impact of the deduction for state and local taxes. I think when we look at that, we should look at the rest of the, uh, of the states. I think also we should look at what those three states do in terms of the use of their monies and to simply say they're higher tax states I think we also need to look at uh, their educational processes, uh, their role in health care in this, in this country as well as their state. And Mr. Buckley, I also think we need to take into account uh, what uh, is, is outlined in your testimony about the impact of long-term bonds. By the way, we, we tried to to um, keep the other bonding program alive, and it now uh, isn't in existence. Uh, the pages aren't numbered, but you indicate $340 billion of annual issuance. Um, it, it, it goes this way, according to estimates. $1.65 trillion in new infrastructure investments over the last 10 years in terms of school construction accounted for almost a third of the infrastructure investments. The other major categories were $288 billion in tax-exempt financing for acute care hospitals, $258 billion for water and sewer improvements, and $178 billion for roads, and $100 billion for mass transit. 
Yes, Mr. Levin, and, and, and let me go back to the discussion of the three big states, because I think the discussion is, is somewhat unfair to the three big states. They, they are large states, they are urban states. Urban areas have higher costs than rural areas. So it, it is unclear in my mind whether they have high tax rates because of the federal deduction or because it is much more expensive to have government in the area of a urban area. They are also high income states. So clearly the tax rates have, the state and local taxes are being invested for reasons that have created wealth in those states. Uh, I think these, and, and, and they are the, one of the, among the largest populated states. So there, there are whole reasons of factors why some states have higher tax burdens that have nothing to do with federal deductibility. They have to do with some of the choices they've made about their educational system that have proved to be valuable to their citizens and because of the urban nature of the state. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Johnson is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hodge, uh, last week the Dallas City Council came in uh, to see me, and in that meeting they expressed strong opposition to doing away with the tax exemption for municipal bonds, which you referred to. According to the city's position paper, and I quote, removing the tax exemption for municipal bonds could raise the city's borrowing costs substantially. The increased borrowing costs would disproportionately impact moderate and low-income residents since higher borrowing costs for the city would mean either doing less or raising property tax or water and sewer fees to cover higher borrowing costs. In your testimony, you make the case for doing away with the tax exemption, and I'm going to ask you about four questions if you would talk to them. In the interest of ensuring a full and fair debate, how would you respond to the council's concerns? One, and two, is the council crying wolf? Three, would borrowing costs actually increase substantially? And four, would property taxes have to go up? Uh, well, in, in not necessarily in that order. Uh, I, they are, <laughs> okay. <laughs> to some degree, yes, they are crying wolf. Uh, they are enjoying a benefit. There, that is absolutely clear. To the extent of how much uh, interest rates would go up, well, that's up to the marketplace and how credit worthy that particular government is. Um, but I think there should be parity between uh, what that government uh, borrows at and what a private sector company in the same community would have to borrow at. Uh, whether or not uh, it would lead to a direct increase in property taxes and, and other taxes to pay for it, it depends. To the, it, 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 it actually might uh, encourage the city um, to uh, reduce its overall amount of borrowing. Uh, and be a little bit more prudent in what it goes about uh, trying to, to, to build. Uh, I think more importantly, if you look at the overall issue, uh, it, this is a very inefficient way of funding uh, uh, municipal projects because about a third of the benefit will go to bondholders, many of them who are upper income, and then a third of the benefit, yes, does go to the community. But you're split as a federal, when you're a federal official looking at this, you're going, wait, we're, we're paying a third extra, essentially, uh, to, to uh, finance this particular local uh, um, project. So it's a very inefficient way to do it. It actually, be, I don't, wouldn't recommend this, it'd be cheaper in a way to just give the cash uh, to a state community or to a local community to build a project, <laughs> rather than giving a third to the bondholder and a third to the community. And in that case, New York would probably want more. It would certainly want more, yes. But thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Mr. Rangel is recognized. Thank you so much. Very interesting, uh, Ms. Hodge, your response to uh, uh, Mr. Levin in terms of your organization receiving tax exemption. And I understand that from your testimony, you believe that if we, we eliminate uh, the subsidies given to local and state governments, we can take that money and lower the rates for taxpayers, and I assume that the contributors to your firm are wealthy taxpayers. I mean, it's not poor people that are doing I, it, right? I, I don't know the net wealth of my No, my you know your constituents. We have, we have everything from little old mine. ladies to, we have uh, contributors well, to little old ladies and, and Do you wealthy. engage in fundraising? We do indeed. And you have no clue as to who 
makes the contribution to your... Oh, we do, yeah, certainly, but... Are uh, they wealthy people? There are some, and then there are some who aren't. Okay, but the whole idea is that you really want to lower tax rates as opposed to assisting uh, states, especially the three that you mentioned, you think that's a giveaway. I ask you this, do you have any idea as the amount of federal taxes that are, contri that are paid to the federal government from these three states and how it relates to states that are less, uh, have less income? Did you ever take a look at it? We do. We we, uh, very, we, annual, we annually the rank the in states the country, in terms. Isn't it? it is because of the the, the progressive nature. It is the nature. highest amount of yeah. revenue in the country. Right now, if an argument was made that because God has blessed these states with resources and that they want to improve their education and their infrastructure and to be a place that's a symbol for American capitalism in this country and the world, just say like New York. Um, <laughs> As an example, Where are you from? Uh, if we have to pay heavily for that in order mm -hmm. to increase the revenue to turn back over to our federal government that makes it possible, don't you really believe that we should get a break for the contribution that we make to society and to your tax-exempt foundation? I think that uh, people like Donald Trump and others on Wall Street can well afford I wish you wouldn't uh, that sort Mr. Of Trump's name. He's not relevant. He really isn't to this discussion. He doesn't. Please wealthy don't people do that. don't need that kind of subsidy. Okay. Well, I, I really would want you to think about whether you would want the lower states that have the lowest educational <clears throat> areas, the lowest paid people, the, 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 the less productive thing. Is it, if you're comparing this as an example for fairness, do you think that makes any sense at all that you should compare the lower states that true they need revenues, but that you compare them with a higher paying tax state that has higher expenses than the rest? You don't believe in equality of the 50 states across the board between those that contribute to the federal government and those that are the beneficiaries of the federal government. Isn't there a difference that has to be considered? The, the economic research shows that uh, all of those citizens would be better off with lower rates. But isn't it true that lower we contribute rates. a large amount of states that you mention in your testimony? They're not givers, they are receivers. And a lot of part of that money comes from California and, and New York. Isn't that true? There's a considerable amount of redistribution. No, no, no. A lot the, of yeah. money comes from the high tax states yeah. and it goes to the lower income states and that's a fact. So when we ask you to consider that, then you should include that in your testimony that we're big givers and, and we don't complain about it. They complain to me but they don't complain to the federal government. We are so pleased that our state is able to do it with the support of our partners. That's what Sandy Hurricane was all about. When one of the states get into trouble, we don't see who's a poor state and who's a rich state, we come in. So for you to single out these three states because we try to be partners with them in rebuilding, when they rebuild for the city, when they rebuild for the state, I'd like to believe that they are rebuilding for our great country as well. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Mr. Reichert's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I want to focus on Washington State now. Um, Mr. Hodge, uh, you, you, you talked about a couple of uh, study models that, that you looked at uh, in your testimony and that those yes. studies that you did suggested that by eliminating the itemized deductions for state and local taxes, uh, that would result in a uh, lowering of tax rates. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? That's correct. The, in, your, in your study models, did you look at those states, and there are just a handful. Uh, Texas is, is one of those from Mr. Johnson's uh, sure. neck of the woods. Um, did you look at the sales tax uh, states? We, we don't have an income tax in the state of Washington. We have a 9% approximately a 9% sales, sales tax. What would happen there? Well, we didn't look at uh, every state specifically in terms of how it would change the mix of their uh, 
uh, their tax base or their economy overall. We were looking at the national results. Um, but you know, generally speaking, uh, the, the citizens of Washington State probably uh, have far fewer state and local tax deductions than would be the citizens of other states because of the mix of, of, of your uh, taxes. While you do have certainly uh, by some counts some higher property taxes, you don't have a personal income tax nor uh, a corporate income tax. You have the, the, the B&O tax and, and some of that I don't think is deductible. So uh, to some extent um, the citizens, the taxpayers in your state would be far better off by giving up the deduction and taking lower federal t uh, income tax rates, uh, uh, and they would be far better off as a result, I think. Do you, you, don't, you don't have an opinion as to whether or not the sales tax might be reduced? The state might move that direction? or Well, s since it's not, I mean, it is deductible to some degree, but, but not like the personal income tax. Um, I, I don't s think that the state would, would necessarily reduce it. Uh, we'd have to, I'd have to give that some more thought. Uh, and this is for the, the panel um, last question, Mr. Chairman. W do you, any of you see a policy reason for doing tax reform uh, and not providing parity for state sales and income taxes, whether, w whether it's, uh, it'd be providing continued permanent deduction for both or eliminating both? You know, I, I, I believe there should be neutrality among the states based on regardless of their choice of revenue sources. And that's been kind of the underlying principle of the state and local tax deduction. It, it was violated somewhat in 1986 when they repealed the state and the tax for state and local real retail sales taxes, but it was replaced, restored. And so I, I think the principle of neutrality among states is one that should be followed in this area. Appreciate that, Mr. Buckley. Any other response? Uh, I would agree with the uh, principle of neutrality. Uh, Congressman, I think also uh, one of the principles that the governors have laid out is one of sovereignty. And I think the discussion I've heard so far is uh, a, a question that uh, really re rests at state capitals and, and between the executive and legislative branches of the states to make those decisions on the uh, uh, the balance, if you will, of their respective uh, state strategies on taxes to create a competitive environment. Okay. Thank you. Um, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Neal is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think I provide a unique perspective because I think Mr. Pasquale and I might be the only two on this side who were formerly uh, mayors of major municipalities. And I can tell you that tax-exempt municipal bonds are the most important tool in the United States for financing investments in schools, roads, bridges, water, and sewer systems. The reality is that these initiatives just wouldn't happen without muni bonds. Bowles Simpson and its 2010 deficit reduction recommendations proposed full taxation for state and local interest for all newly issued bonds. A recent report shows that if this proposal had been in place during the 2003 to 2012 period, it's estimated that $1.65 trillion of state and local infrastructure would have cost governments an additional $495 billion of interest expense. For Boston, the tax exemption of loss over that period would have resulted in a $55 million cost increase. These numbers are staggering, and the reality is that state and local governments can't withstand those additional costs. John, uh, in our zeal to do tax reform here, which we all agree upon, there apparently are many options that we could consider to raise revenue. You and I have worked over the years on a number of proposals to close tax loopholes. And what do you think of eliminating or capping tax-exempt financing as it relates to good policy? I, you know, I, I think you can pretend that there are economic benefits from capping or repealing the exclusion only if you believe this country will benefit by lower investment in public infrastructure. The, the exemption goes directly to the cost of funds for state and local governments, which you've experienced. The, the answer to Mr. Johnson is his, his, constitu his governments will pay higher interest rates. I don't think there's anybody in this room will disagree with the proposition that repeal of the exclusion will increase interest rates to state and local issuers, increasing their cost of investment, reducing public infrastructure. Mr. Parkhurst. Uh, Congressman, uh, question's a very interesting one. I uh, would argue that uh, 
capping this benefit, uh, to, to your point, would indeed, I think, raise the uh, uh, cost by simply uh, uh, a percentage. And I think we've seen estimates anywhere up of uh, 60 to upwards of uh, 200 basis points. But I think, interestingly, if the uh, purpose of the cap is to uh, you know, address revenue issues, uh, it may be a challenge uh, given that, based on uh, uh, IRS data for uh, 2010, itemizing taxpayers uh, seem to fall primarily who uh, claim uh, interest on uh, uh, muni bonds uh, are making less than $250,000. Uh, and I think going forward, if the cap is applied in particular to all taxpayers, you're going to be effectively taxed twice. Uh, as uh, uh, Professor Buckley says, obviously we're going to be taxed on the uh, increased cost to uh, infrastructure, and uh, we will see uh, uh, obviously the direct tax here that uh, you're, you're referencing. Okay. Let me turn for a moment to Build America bonds. Uh, John Buckley and I, along with Alan Kruger, worked very hard on Build America bonds. They were part of the 2009 stimulus legislation. BABs are taxable bonds for which the U.S. Treasury Department pays a 35 percent subsidy to the issuer to offset borrowing costs. They were a huge success around the country. Virtually everybody who had an airport expansion, they were done with Build America bonds uh, during that period of time. And I must tell you that the Accelerated Bridge Program was very successful. And across Massachusetts, the Build America bonds were a smash. Now, I want to ask you, John, do you think that this would have happened without Build America bonds? It, Build America bonds were enacted at a time when the municipal bond market was in free fall. There, there was no market for tax-exempt bonds because of the economic downturn. So clearly, it responded to a tremendous need uh, at that time. I also think it is the response to the argument that the exclusion is inefficient. You can dramatically lower the rate of the subsidy that was provided in Build America bonds and still dramatically increase the efficiency of the market for tax-exempt bonds. So I think it is something that has to be looked at in the long run because state and local issuers are facing a, a shrinking market for tax-exempt bonds. And, okay. and New Markets tax credits, it was designed to stimulate investment in low-income communities. It's been overlooked by conventional capital markets, and it has generated more than $45 billion in capital for projects in low-income communities. In Northampton, the Holyoke Public Library, the Colonial Theater in Pittsfield, cities across the country have use new markets tax credits to incent certain behaviors. I've been a real champion from day one of new markets tax credits. Again, very, very successful. And how might cities attract private investment into communities with high unemployment and deteriorated property without the use of these incentives? Right. Quick, could you do that Thank quickly, you. Mr. But Chairman? Very quickly, because time's expired. I, I believe that those, the new markets tax credit and the low-income housing tax credit are important parts of encouraging redevelopment in low-income areas. The market does not allocate resources to those areas. So if you repeal those, you're relying on market allocations, and you will, receive, you will see less development, less low-income housing as a result. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Dr. Price is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank the, uh, the uh, uh, panelists for their presentation. I'm Mr. Hodge, you, you uh, make the case that the um, uh, federal government ought to be agnostic uh, as it relates to um, deduction for state and local taxes, uh, municipal bonds and the like. Can you help me understand why, what, what the rationale was for, at the beginning for the, the, the uh, providing for uh, tax exemption for state and local taxes? Sure. And well, in, According to, to the principles of sound tax policy, we shouldn't pay taxes uh, on income that's already been taxed uh, by another level of government. In the same way that we have foreign tax credits where companies don't have to pay tax on, or they get to deduct taxes paid abroad, uh, a similar rationale applies here. Um, and I think that that's, that's true. As a tax purist, I would say we generally shouldn't have to pay taxes on, uh, on taxes that are, or income that's already been taxed at the local level. However, uh, we ought to look also at the economic effects of that kind of policy. And in this case, uh, the policy, uh, the, the unintended consequences of this policy are more harmful, I think, in the long run and outweigh whatever benefit uh, comes from that. Is, so it, 
Is that because of a, of a difference in, in rates between states? So different citizens are paying different rates and therefore they're treated differently? Is that, is that part of your rationale? Well, generally speaking, uh, and this goes back to 1913 when the code was originally written, uh, all state taxes uh, were deductible. And then over time it's been whittled away in various fashions. Today uh, it's further eroded because of the AMT and the mm -hmm. P's provisions, which already uh, reduce the value of these de deductions. So, uh, you know, the Congress has already made this policy decision to limit these deductions in some fashion. And the question is, do we take it to the next level and just eliminate it for all taxpayers? We already do it for high-income taxpayers, and the question is, do we do it for everyone? Yeah. Um, Mr. Buckley makes the case, I think, that, um, that if, if this exempt, exemption were, were to go away for um, uh, municipal bonds and the like, that, that would drive up costs for infrastructure projects and, and, uh, um, uh, and, and the, the bonds that would then be let, and that therefore I think is the, is the argument that then taxes would go up for the individuals in that municipality to pay for the increased cost for the project. Tell me, what, that, that makes some sense to me. Tell me why that isn't the case. Well, no, it probably is the case uh, because, you know, th these projects are getting a federal subsidy. So more of the cost would fall on local uh, taxpayers, which means that local officials would have to be entirely uh, upfront uh, with local uh, taxpayers about the cost, and they couldn't shift part of the cost uh, to the federal government. So the argument is that this is, that, that doing away with the exemption then becomes a much more transparent, much more honest way of governance. Absolutely, and, and brings more responsibility to, to uh, local officials uh, to maintain those costs and reduce those costs and ultimately reduce the long-term uh, 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 borrowing cost to future taxpayers. Because we've got to remember, this is an obligation on future taxpayers to pay off those bonds. Mm -hmm. So by, by essentially subsidizing it at the federal level, you're encouraging more and more of that activity at the local level, putting a greater burden on future taxpayers. Mr. And Parker, that's what we've seen in the recent data. Mr. Parker, why doesn't that make any sense? I just want to highlight one key point here, Congressman. When we're talking about investments in infrastructure, we're talking about long-term capital assets that have a long life cycle. So it makes eminent sense to be issuing long-term debt for infrastructure that's going to benefit. But I think Mr. Hodges' argument was that, that the process gets more transparent, more accountable, and the, and the elected officials become more than responsive to their constituents. Why, why, why is well, that I'd, true? I'd argue that uh, given that for many states and municipalities that uh, are issuing debt, many are doing it either through a uh, public referendum where they've got to go to the voters to explain why they are going to be uh, issuing bonds. There are caps that are held. Transparency uh, is, uh, 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 I think, well, well addressed, I think, at the municipal level uh, through that at this point right now. I'm not certain what the... Uh, uh, Delta would be on additional transparency from uh, Mr. Hodges. Mr. Hodge? I, I think that the more we can make this process transparent, the better. And if we look at the, the increase in debt over the last, uh, say, 12 years relative to the amount of that debt that's gone to new infrastructure, there's a, there's a lot of money missing. Uh, very, there's been very little new investment in infrastructure relative to the, the tremendous amount of new debt that's been taken on. So, I, you know, I'd... All right, we'll Thank leave you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Doggett's recognized. After Mr. Doggett concludes, we'll go two to one on this side. So, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there is probably uh, no uh, perfect way to ensure uh, public input, public participation for a truly public interest uh, revision of our complex tax laws. But I think uh, what the chairman has done in terms of laying out proposals for public comment uh, last year on international tax, uh, recently on derivatives, uh, is a step in the right direction, as is uh, this hearing. Uh, I'm less confident about uh, how uh, productive in assuring the public interest is represented in this revision. Uh, how the working groups are operating. In fact, one of them is meeting as we convene here now with uh, groups that are interested in what is happening in the energy code, and many of these working groups are overlapping. Uh, all of them are done in private, uh, and they do provide some insight, but they do not 
really provide an opportunity for uh, all members of the committee to participate in all of these really important groups. And so I think that process is, is not uh, quite as productive. Uh, and the more hearings like this we can have to explore uh, all the implications of tax code revision, I think the better product we will get. Uh, you've covered a lot of territory about how we finance infrastructure. Uh, I would like to return to a topic that the chairman asked you about, and that is on private activity bonds. While I realize that is a small portion of the overall uh, municipal or uh, bond market, uh, the suggestion in the recent uh, Times critique of the private activity bond market uh, referred to a bipartisan policy center study suggesting that uh, it, the private activity bond market amounts to a cost to the Treasury of $50 billion over 10 years. Uh, is that uh, a, a fair analysis of what the cost of that program is? Let, let me say that it, the, their estimate makes the point that I was trying to make in my testimony that it is an extremely small piece of, of the overall cost of tax exempt bonds. It, indeed, and I yeah. agree, but $50 it, billion dollars is $50 billion. <laughs> right. Now, also, the term private activity bond picks up a whole wide range of activities. Uh, bonds issued on behalf of private colleges are private activity bonds. Bonds issued for transportation infrastructure, wharves, docks, airports, where there is a mixed public-private are private activity bonds. So th there's a w wide range here. Now, I do believe it is an area where the committee should look at. I mean, and there were some, some standards set in the 1986 reform that have gradually been eroded or accepted so that uh, while at that time you couldn't finance golf courses, now some of the subsequent disaster relief proposals but have... It, what what you, you absolutely have to do is not enact, you know, kind of scattershot disaster relief provisions that just simply waive all the limitations on private activity bonds. And our eagerness to respond to disasters, whether Texas, New York, Louisiana, anywhere else. The Midwest, uh, that's correct. Sometimes those standards are forgotten, but isn't the best way to ensure that doesn't happen to have strong, clear standards in the law uh, about when private activity bonds can be used or to eliminate them entirely? Well, I, I think there are standards in the law. I, I would caution against eliminating them entirely because I think you will, that will affect some types of infrastructure that are valuable and that you will desire. This is an area where I think the committee should, should look Why at. Why can't those other forms of infrastructure be uh, to the extent that uh, they deserve uh, any uh, preference or federal subsidy uh, be financed uh, through general obligation bonds? Just because there's a mixed public-private use is, is the only reason. The, the Times article suggested that the largest uh, beneficiary of uh, private activity bonds had been Chevron. That, that was a disaster-related provision. And uh, would be the kind of provision that while Chevron might get a benefit, uh, Joe's Chevron station that's a small business in the same area is not accorded any benefit. They could have probably accessed it as well, but they did not. Mm -hmm. uh, do uh, Mr. Taylor, uh, Mr. Hodge, Mr. Parkhurst, uh, I know you've, you've uh, raised questions uh, pro and con on bonds generally, but specifically on private activity bonds, uh, should they be limited? Are and new just, standards necessary? Just answer very briefly, because time's expired. My answer is yes, they should be eliminated. If, the, uh, if you're going to give a benefit, give it to the state and local government directly. If they don't want to finance it, I, I don't see a reason that the private sector should benefit in any way. At this point, I think the governors would uh, want to examine all the options on the table before making any final decisions. All right. Thank you very much. Mr. Buchanan is recognized yeah. for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing today. And I'd like to thank all our witnesses for taking their time out to be here. As a member from Florida, I'm the only member on Ways and Means, but in my district we have 200,000 retirees, uh, and I know that they count on municipal bonds as a stable investment. Mr. Parkhurst or any of you, uh, I've got a sense of it myself, 
you know, as an investor over the years, but how safe are municipal bonds uh, in terms of a, a sound investment for retirees? Municipal bonds are probably one of the, if not the safest uh, investment that uh, uh, my parents, who are retirees, uh, could, uh, could, could invest in. I think, and I'll defer to Dr. Buckley on the specific numbers, but I think it is well below 1% uh, default rate. Uh, interesting point on uh, retirees. Uh, again, citing back to the uh, uh, 2010 tax data I referenced earlier, it's in my testimony. Uh, of those uh, taxpayers that uh, uh, ex identify uh, on their tax forms an exemption for uh, interest uh, from muni bonds, uh, five out of ten of those taxpayers are 65, degree, uh, 65 years or uh, older. So seniors do comprise a large section of uh, investors in muni bonds, either directly or through their uh, uh, mutual funds uh, that, that do also invest in these uh, Mr. Uh, Buckley, do you have a, actually a number, a percentage or something? I mean, I, I, I assume 1 percent. I just, I just wanted to kind of hear it. But I, I, do, I do not have a specific number. The, the, the default rate has been low in, in this area. Okay. The other thing was just in terms of this, you, do you have any sense of what percentage are owned by retirees uh, in terms of these pension funds? Do you have any sense of uh, 65 and older individuals? I, I don't have a specific answer for you, Congressman. I can look into that. I, I would say, though, just to give you a little more macro perspective, uh, the, the market is made up of both retail and institutional investors, and the retail investors are who you're referring to at this point, individuals who are, are purchasing. Uh, they also include the uh, uh, individual investors who uh, have been uh, uh, discussed here as well. On the institutional side, the primary investors in municipal bonds are uh, PNC, property and casualty insurance companies, as well as uh, banks. Not necessarily the large banks, but more regional and community banks that are reinvesting in uh, infrastructure investments within their communities. Okay. Mr. Buckley, uh, the National Federation of Independent Businesses, uh, NFIB, and I've seen that from our local chambers as well, they surveyed their, their members who make up the small business community across the country, and 85 percent of their, their members think that Congress should uh, do uh, tax reform, uh, change the federal tax code. However, they retain they favor retaining the deduction for state and local taxes even in exchange for lower tax rates. So they'd like to, they want tax reform, but they'd like to retain the exemptions for state and federal governments. Why, why do you think that is, or do you have any sense of that? Well, I th I, first of all, as, as was mentioned previously, repealing the deduction effectively increases their marginal rate. So if, if you repeal the deduction for state income taxes and replace it with a lower rate, you, you really haven't done much. You, you've, you've substituted one form of marginal rate increase for a marginal rate decrease. Also, my guess is the small business community has to be very concerned about the question of whether corporations would have their deduction for state and local taxes repealed. Uh, it is hard in my mind to justify taking the deduction away from unincorporated businesses and continuing it for corporate businesses. Now, in the corporate context, the, the rationale for the deduction is as strong as it is on the individual side. So my guess is they're worried about discrimination here. And one other thing, Bull Simpson uh, and other groups, advisory panel for the president, want to eliminate the deduction, and why is that, do you think? Why do they, why do they feel they, because at the end of the day, you'd, you'd think it would create more jobs, more opportunities, put more dollars into the Treasury in terms of people being employed, but why, why did they come up with that analysis? Revenue. <laughs> just, just revenue to finance rate reductions, that's all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Buckley. I, I do appreciate your comment that actually reducing the rate would have all taxpayers being treated more similarly, as opposed to those taxpayers in those states that have high incomes and use the deduction more. But if you, if you do eliminate that and lower the rate, uh, there is not a marginal rate increase. There, and I think there, that's what there I is, There say. is a marginal rate increase. Depending not on, if you lower the rate. Well, not it, if you I lower the rate. Say, depending on the state in which you reside. Yes, but yeah. you could lower the rate and there may not be a marginal rate increase and then you wouldn't have tax policy favoring certain states and certain constituencies well, in a way that they don't now. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I, 
I disagree with favoring notion here. I, I, you know, there are states that are urban in nature and therefore they have higher incomes and higher tax deductions. There are cities, Seattle, in the state of Washington, where the tax burdens are higher than they are in the rest of the state. The, using averages here doesn't really, I, I don't think, accurately reflects what, what's going on. All right. Thank you. Mr. Smith is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses today. Mr. Buckley, you uh, briefly touched on uh, the, your assertion that higher taxes in various states are perhaps because of a higher uh, cost of living. Um, wouldn't that, I mean, shouldn't higher wages generate higher taxes per capita? That, that's correct. I mean, the, the reason some states have higher taxes than others is a combination both of higher incomes and of higher cost of government, I would argue, largely due to the urban nature of the state. Now, those states also, as, as Congressman Rangel pointed out, are typically the donor states. They pay far greater share of federal income tax liability than other states for exactly the same reason. They're, they're high income uh, states. But that should also reflect on what they what their tax burden is at the state level or, and or local level, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, we've heard briefly about the uh, public power and taxes on public power and perhaps a, a different treatment than private power. Uh, Mr. Taylor, I, coming from a public power state, I, I'm curious because I, I almost feel like there's more transparency in terms of Okay, there's tax-free municipal bond advantages there, but then we know that in other, uh, in other states there are uh, power generators in the private sector that enjoy a, a number, in fact, perhaps a smorgasbord of, of tax benefits. Is that accurate? I'm not in a position to compare the states and the public power in, and private power in different states. I think my concern was that the federal government is providing a benefit or a subsidy or whatever you would tax expenditure for state and local governments. And I think it then behooves the committee to determine where that benefit is going. I think Mr. Hodge uh, uh, said earlier, listen, you could essentially eliminate tax exemption on municipal bonds and then decide where you want the money to be spent. It might be a more efficient way to do that. It, it's not for me to sit here and say, okay, it should always go to A or B. That's really your decision. That being said, if you're going to talk about state and local governments and those governmental bodies that are making decisions, they should be the ones govern, you know, getting the tax exemption and it should be very clear. In the case of Nebraska or other places where public power is a big issue, then you have to sit there and say, to what extent is the state controlling that? Is it substituting for private power? At what point should you stop substituting for private power and let the private power companies come in? That's, those are governmental decisions that should be taken very carefully because you run the risk with tax exemption of it substituting for the private sector and it remaining that way even though the economy changes. Okay. Anyone else wish to comment? No? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Blumenauer is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate continuing this process of trying to dive into um, the tax code and the implications, and I appreciate the the balanced presentation here that gives, gives us a range of uh, concerns. Um, I want to go back to the infrastructure piece. I appreciate what my colleague uh, Mr. Neal talked about. Um, and Mr. Buckley, you're uh, providing some, some balance here. It, I find it well, There's two of us, I think, are. <laughs> uh, I find it interesting that we're having this hearing today when the American Society for Civil Engineers is putting out its uh, update of its scorecard, which it has been doing over the years. Um, we're still uh, Ds, Fs, uh, I think a C minus may be in there. And the cumulative deficit, by their estimate, is 3.6 uh, 
trillion dollars necessary for the standard between now and 2020. Um, it's interesting to me that the era of highest economic growth and productivity increase, and by the way, dramatic reduction in federal debt after World War II, occurred when we made the investments in our returning veterans for their education and enabled them to buy a home. The interstate highway system is an obvious ex example. But we had other infrastructure investments in higher education, in aviation, in water, in sewer, uh, in areas that now communities are looking at skyrocketing rates, uh, by the way, uh, rates that are not tax deductible at the local level for utilities, um, at a time when we're scaling back the federal infrastructure investment. Um, and looking at the bill that we just passed that expires uh, this Congress for transportation, um, we're really kind of stuck here. It, it strikes me that looking at adjusting the interest exem exemption in these tax deductible bonds is one of the few areas where the federal government is actually stepping up and providing support for infrastructure investment. Uh, do you want to? I, I, I would agree entirely and, and, and also state that it is the only stable source of federal support for local infrastructure spending. It is there. It is not subject to an extension of the highway bill. It is something that state and local governments can plan on. And also, it is a form of federal support that has the least amount of federal involvement in it. All of the decisions about what infrastructure to invest in, how to structure the debt, are questions that are left to the, the prerogatives of state and local government with no federal in interference. It, it is a fairly conservative way of deliver, delivering support here. And I know time is short, Mr. Chairman, so I'll just uh, prepare to yield back my time. But I think this is a very important concept that the committee should consider as we move forward. Uh, I hope that we are spending a little more time looking at infrastructure, uh, but the consequences of this investment in areas that have tended to be more productive, that have created more wealth, that have challenges and opportunities, um, that people have the choice, it's the amount of benefit to the communities is commensurate with, dis with decisions they have made locally. Uh, but I think the, the multiple effects that the entire country benefits from in terms of increased economic activity and, frankly, reduced pressure for other types of federal investment uh, bears our being careful with uh, how we move forward with this. Mr. Taylor? I, uh, yes, I would like to comment on that. While I actually agree with both of you on this, it, in terms of the fact that the decisions are made locally, that the infrastructure is very much needed, the question is, is this the most efficient way and are you getting the bang for your buck? And I think as an economist and someone who's been involved with this area back to 1975, there is no doubt in the economic literature that some program like BABs maybe not at 33 percent or 20, maybe it's 28, maybe it's 25. BABs is a much more efficient way to say where the money goes. And I'm all for state and local governments designing well, I, and it. I, I, let's make it efficient. I, I appreciate the opportunity that we can fine tune the way that some of the programs are administered. We've had this conversation in the past with Mr. Buckley when we were for factoring other things. Um, but I just stand by my point that I'd be very careful about monkeying with this. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman Thank from you. Texas is recognized for five minutes. Thank, <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I, too, have heard from every one of my uh, school districts, my cities, counties in my district. I have a, a very unique district. The center of my district is the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. And over the last 50 years, that uh, airport has spurred uh, growth, both in industry as well as population. And um, 
I started my political career as a city council member and a mayor, so I am someone that, that has sat in meetings uh, and looked at water projects, road projects, uh, school projects, projects to bring infrastructure to major industry that wanted to locate in our town, and made those decisions based on the fact that the municipal bond rate was a rate that we could take advantage of and expand our infrastructure. Uh, I don't think there's any mistake that if Congress decides to do away with the exemption for municipal bonds, for school district bonds, for county bonds, that every single taxpayer in my district will have an increase in their taxes. Uh, the, the cities have to provide infrastructure. They have to provide uh, water, sewer. Uh, they have to provide that because they are trying to attract the industry, the very industries that are going to bring the jobs to that town. Now, it, it might be, uh, for instance, we, we have in our local town, we have Amazon is bringing a one million square foot uh, distribution warehouse because of its proximity to the airport. Could not have done that without a major road project, could not have done that without adequate water, without adequate city sewer, uh, without, a, without an adequate workforce who needs schools. So for us to, uh, our, our goal to simplify the tax code, I, I agree with. Our goal to uh, lower taxes across the board, I agree. But for us to think that we are going to be lowering tax rates for our, for our citizens, in this case, all we're going to be doing is passing that tax down to a different level. Uh, municipal bonds provided the major catalyst for us making those decisions in school districts, in cities and counties across the nation, in every council meeting, every school board meeting, every county supervisor meeting, uh, almost every week are making those decisions to create jobs, create uh, uh, the infrastructure for that. And so uh, my point today is that maybe we need to look at private activity bonds. Uh, maybe we should take a, a very close look at the, the entire spectrum but the core uh, deductibility of municipal bonds, corp, uh, of uh, tax exempt bonds, uh, will all it will do is create a pure tax shift. And I'd like to have each of yours uh, opinion on, on, on that comment. Mr. Hodge. Um, Congressman, I, I know that uh, property tax issue is a very hot issue in Texas these days. And there's been a lot of attempts to try to control the growth of property taxes. But I would suggest that it's possible that it's the availability of municipal bonds and the ability to borrow that has in some way contributed to those higher property taxes because of the communities and, and school districts that are over borrowing and thus taxing uh, their, their local taxpayers. So it is a circular thing. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's a chicken and egg. Uh, uh, situation, but I would suggest that the evidence shows that if you were to eliminate these bonds, it would actually end up lowering property taxes overall because communities would not borrow as much and spend as much. And so over time, I think that those property taxes and local taxes would come back down. That's what the economic evidence shows. Ms. Parkers. Congressman, I think your comments are in accord with the nation's governors. Uh, I appreciate those thoughts. I'd like to leave you with an uh, interesting uh, uh, data point that I think will help you the next time you have visitors from constituents back home. Uh, and not being an economist, I, I like to use numbers, but uh, I can always discount. Uh, they are proposed, uh, proposed next year of $43 billion in lost revenue to uh, the federal government from the uh, interest exclusion. There's also a projected increase, uh, a sale of $400 billion in new issuances in uni bonds. It's about a 10 to 1 ratio. That's a pretty good leverage ratio for the dollars. All right, thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Ms. Black is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that um, my colleague from Texas certainly does make a valid argument um, related to the investment in infrastructure. But as we read in the New York Times, um, they reported 
recently that the tax exempt bonds have been used, as the chairman said, for things like a winery in North Carolina and a golf course in Puerto Rico, <coughs> a Corvette museum. I probably should um, temper my, um, my comments on that since my husband's a big Corvette person. But, um, but when we look at these, um, do you think that this is, first of all, an appropriate use uh, for these kinds of projects, as my colleague talked about, um, infrastructure, uh, questioning these as infrastructures. And then, um, in addition to that, what kind of rules could be changed to prevent these types of activities from happening in the future? So um, why don't we start with you, Mr. Buckley, and work down the other way? Well, first, I think it is entirely appropriate for this committee to examine the rules for private activity bonds. And, and they were tightened in 86. Now, a lot of the examples in the New York Times articles were a response of one-time liberalizations of the rules as part of disaster relief uh, measures. And, and, and I would suggest the committee ought not to do that again in the future. I mean, they, they should tighten the rules. Now, a lot of what was previously talked about are private activity bonds. When, when, when you were talking about the airport development and all of that, those are private activity bonds. And so they do serve, I believe, bona fide public purposes of development, uh, helping, you know, as you say, you're, you, the Amazon would not have come but for the, the railroad development. The, the highways in that circumstance may well be considered private activity bonds because of disproportionate use by one, mm -hmm. one uh, taxpayer. So I, I, I believe you should examine those rules. Uh, you should tighten them if necessary, but don't use those, you know, anecdotal stories in the New York Times to justify repeal of a provision that I think has proved to be quite effective. Mr. Taylor. In some ways, I would agree with Mr. Buckley, but I would also add that any time you give, and I hate to pick on DFW again, if you're going to, if you're going to use the tax <coughs> exemption there, it benefited certain airlines over other airlines in terms of allocation of landing slots and the whole kit and caboodle. You had a, a corporate purpose that was involved in this. I have absolutely no pro uh, problem with the congressman's discussion, the previous congressman's discussion about water and sewer and schools and things like that. I think it is imperative that the committee decide to what activities does this benefit flow to? And if you, personally, I have a, que a question in my mind of, the, of any kind of benefit flowing down to one particular corporation or another without it being available to everyone, and that's what the markets are for. So if you, eliminate, if you limit tax exemption to standard governmental purposes, that we all could probably agree on here, fine. But once it gets into the, anything that flows to the private sector, you should be very, very careful. Mr. Taylor, I want to just tag onto that for just a second because you mentioned Build America bonds. Would they, and I don't know that much about them, would they be any different than in making these kinds of determinations? Well, then? I'll go back to a comment that uh, Mr. Hodges made earlier on, that the way the tax exemption is structured right now a certain portion of the dollar that you're providing goes to the investor. And so is that really what you want to do? The answer usually is no, and there isn't an economist. Heck, I've read, uh, when I first got involved with munis, the studies were going back to 1963 saying do it a la BABs. Do it that way because it's the most efficient way to give the money. And, and let the decision be make, making be at the lower level. I think the real question is, what's that rate? Is it 28, which I've heard bandied about, or 25? That's your decision. But it's a much better way to get the bang for the buck. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. Parker. Rather than tax exemption. Uh, briefly, I would uh, concur with uh, Mr. Buckley's comments that uh, working and to review the rules would make uh, eminent sense to correct the anomalies. And I would offer up an opportunity for uh, uh, this committee to reach out to states and local governments that have the direct hands-on experience with many of these private activity bonds to uh, work in partnership in that. Mr. Hodge, I'm out of time, so if you have any remarks um, <coughs> pertaining to that, if you will submit it, that would be great. Very Thank quickly. You. 
I certainly will. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Pascrell is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, the panelists. Uh, good to see you back, Mr. Buckley. You're part of your, I don't see you, <laughs> but I'm here. Uh, you stated that the debate over tax reform cannot be merely driven by tax policy concerns. Uh, this committee has to take into account the possible collateral consequences of changes to longstanding tax benefits. Just give me one sentence of summary in your own mind. I, I would use two examples. Home values. There, I don't think there is any economist in the country that doesn't think the price of our homes have embedded in them the value of the deduction for mortgage interest and real property taxes. I really think the Congress has to be very careful of, about removing those benefits. I, I think it would be quite destructive to have further decline in housing prices by reason of what actions taken by Congress. Employer provided health care. Almost all of us get our health care through our employer. If you repeal the exclusion for employer provided health care, you will see a decline in the level of health care coverage provided by the employer. I think that's a bad thing. So in solving one, we will create another problem. The, the, you will have to respond with appropriated funds if people lose their health insurance. That's because we discussed that, as you remember, during the debate on, that is uh, correct. on uh, Obamacare. Uh, Mr. Hodge, if we follow, if we pursue your path, what you're suggesting is we will never, ever repair our infrastructure for water and sewers in this country. We lose 25 percent of our water that's already been treated because of the antiquated system that we have and will not repair it, and the municipalities do not have the money, the states do not have the money to do this, so we might as well just wait till they have the money. Well, you know what happens in that circumstance. That is not acceptable. That is not acceptable. And I agree with the gentleman from Texas that these things will not get done unless these bonds exist unless these private equity bonds exist. We've had legislation before us for 10 years, passed in this House three times, three times, installed in the Senate. Right, Mr. Camp, Mr. Chairman? We need to keep the collateral consequences that Mr. Buckley refers in mind, as well as the policy goals we wish to accomplish through our tax code. One big collateral consequence I'm concerned about is in the area, and you've heard about it, the state and local tax provisions, what, is what, happen, what would happen to high-cost states like New Jersey if we eliminate the deduction for state and local taxes. According to the National Association of Home Builders, the average New Jersey property owner has 7,398 in real estate deductions. I think Texas is close to $5,500 a year. That's, that's more than double the national average, uh, the New Jersey number. I believe that eliminating this deduction could have a real devastating impact on my state and many other states. We need to think long and hard about the effect it would have. We have a long way to go to get to the $6 trillion. The Tax Policy Center says we need to, find, uh, to, f to, uh, to finance the Ryan Camp tax reform proposal. And these are the kinds of issues we need to examine in depth. Mr. Buckley, can you describe how impact of eliminating the capping of deduction for state and local taxes would be different for high-cost regions of the country? And the second question is, isn't repealing this deduction just a covert marginal rate hike that would double tax individuals' on income? And how is this different how we treat foreign source income, Mr. Buckley? Well, you, you raise the interesting point. We, we do provide a foreign tax credit, a dollar-for-dollar dollar reduction in U.S. tax liability for the amount of foreign taxes you pay. Nobody has ever asserted that that's a subsidy for foreign countries. It's an appropriate measure of reducing the potential for double taxation. We provide a far less generous accommodation for the state taxes 
an accommodation that I believe is appropriate to prevent double taxation. Now, it will have particular impact on states with high incomes, but those states typically are net donors to the federal government. Thank you, Mr. Buckley. Uh, recent report, oh, my time is up. Mr. Chairman, you are back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Young, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank all our panelists for a, a very interesting conversation today and for your appearance here today. Yeah, I, know. Um, I represent Indiana's 9th Congressional District, and, and the communities throughout my 13 county district uh, rely heavily uh, in, in various ways on, on uh, tax exempt uh, bonds. But the, the question, uh, I think, for many of us policymakers here is, uh, of course, the issue of unintended consequences, which has been brought up a number of times, sometimes called collateral consequences. Um, I, I see that always as a potential uh, consequence of, of acting uh, in the federal sphere. You're, you're going to have unintended consequences. Uh, what is incumbent upon us is to fully weigh all the evidence before us and, and try and mitigate those consequences. Um, uh, before uh, we act. Um, we also tend to be risk averse here in Washington. So um, we will hear a lot of qualifying language from my colleagues, perhaps occasionally from myself, about this could happen. We need to weigh things very heavily before acting. But at some point, uh, there is a risk to not changing policies towards a more optimal public policy approach of, of uh, tax exempt bonds here, uh, uh, if one exists. So, um, you know, I come back to the theme that people really don't fear change so much as they fear loss. And if we can prove that adopting a new mechanism of funding these infrastructure projects and uh, bonding out various projects uh, is, is better, then um, it ought to be adopted. Um, I'm not persuaded as yet entirely, but uh, there are some things that I want to explore here. Mr. Hodge, you said for each million dollar in tax exempt bonds, the federal government foregoes $21,000. Uh, so there's, that's a potential benefit to the federal coffers at least, could conceivably have what is called collateral consequences at the local level. Uh, and uh, you yourself, Mr. Hodge, have, have conceded that at least initially there might be uh, property tax implications on, on changing uh, the tax status of these bonds. But you alluded to something very interesting. You said in the longer term, and uh, uh, you said absent this deduction, state and local governments would have lower overall taxes and would have smaller budgets. Um, I can think of a couple of dynamics that might uh, lead to this. Greater project scrutiny at the local level, conceivably, might be one reason. Another reason would be greater competition for capital between communities and across states. Uh, is, is that a potential thing that would, that would, uh, that would drive the lower overall taxes yeah. and uh, smaller budgets? Okay. So, so that's the positive side of the ledger. The negative side, Mr. Parkhurst, you listed off a, a number of, of concerns, um, and, and I'd like to go through those. An increase in direct taxes on citizens. So this is the burden shifting concern, right? Do you disagree with the notion, though, that in the longer term, uh, you might actually see lower overall taxes and smaller budgets as a result of, of changing the tax exempt status? And if so, why do you disagree with that notion? I think given the dynamics of the country's uh, economics, conditions, regions, it's hard to give you a definitive answer on a hypothetical at that point right now. I would argue that uh, what we can see happening or what we could uh, perceive happening is just that point. Is that shift in uh, uh, projects that either don't get done because the state and local officials make a rational decision that with limited dollars we can only do X and not Y? Or if the decision is made that we must uh, pursue a particular infrastructure project, either because it's crisis-driven or uh, the public has uh, uh, made a decision, either through referenda or uh, other by electing uh, individuals that are making these decisions, to increase their taxes. I think then that's uh, uh, the, uh, 
response that uh, I'm looking at in the short term. But long term, at this point, I don't think I could uh, give you a definitive answer to uh, Okay, to well, the there, there, there are various academic studies supporting this idea that there will be long-term benefits to changing the tax-exempt status. Uh, Doug, Doug Holtz-Eakin and Larry Lindsay, for example, have studies mm -hmm. that uh, the National Governors Association may consult to get further clarity on this. Uh, Mr. Hodge, got about 10 seconds left, I think. Do you have any thoughts about this? No, the academic uh, uh, evidence is very clear that um, uh, if you were to remove these, these subsidies, then overall uh, spending at the state and local level would decline and uh, taxes would reduce all, uh, overall as well. Okay. We'll continue to explore this. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis, you're recognized. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And, you know, I was thinking one of the good things about being near the end is you get a chance to hear all of those things that have been said before you. And when the question arose or came up about Bill America bonds, I just happened to have six pages of projects <laughs> that were either done or completed or underway in the state of Illinois, most of which I suspect would not have been on the table unless these bonds were available. Also, I thought about the article in the New York Times. I grew up in rural America, and people often used containers to take a bath. They didn't all have indoor plumbing. And when they got ready to throw out the bath water, there was an old saying, that don't throw out the baby <laughs> with the bath water. <laughs> I, I, I mean, there are some components of some things that may not be as effective or as good, but that doesn't mean the whole concept is not worthy. Uh, like my good friend from Texas, Mr. Bishop, I think many of us have had some experiences with local government. And I also think that many of us are firmly convinced that many local infrastructure projects would never get done if the bonds were not available, that they would just simply lay flat, nothing would happen, and the need would continue to exist. So I think that they have been lifesavers for infrastructure development in these communities all over America. But let me ask, there are some proposals, and Mr. Buckley, let me ask you. There are proposals to reduce the tax exemption on municipal bond interest, such as one to cap the exemption for certain taxpayers at 28 percent would have severely detrimental impact on national infrastructure development and the municipal market, raising costs for state and local borrowers and creating uncertainty for investors. These investors' fears translate into investor demands for higher yield from state and local governments issuing the bonds. If these entities are unable to satisfy investor yield demand, then isn't it true that either, one, these much needed infrastructure projects would not move forward, or the cost of these projects would be passed directly to state and local taxpayers? You, you have two problems, I think, when you, when you legislate in this area. First is the uncertainty that you're talking about. Just, just the fact that this hearing is going on is creating insert, uncertainty in the market about the, the long-term viability of, ta of the tax exemption, there, thereby demand, demanding higher yields. You, the, the question whether it's going to increase costs and reduce infrastructure that higher yields, I think that's absolutely correct. You can assert that there are economic benefits from repealing the exemption only if you believe that it is in the best interest of this country 
to have lower investment in public infrastructure. I, the, the, you know, when, when Mr. Hodge talks about lower spending at state and local levels, it's all infrastructure. So if you believe we have over-invested in infrastructure, which I don't think anybody does, then you should entertain proposals to repeal this benefit. If you believe that infrastructure is very valuable, then you should not. Uh, the cap has, has some impact on tax exempt rates. I've seen a lot of uh, different estimates and I'm really not in a position to judge which one is right. I mean, some show it as a fairly low, some show it as fairly high. In your written testimony, you, you also indicated a need to maintain a balance between individual exemptions or deductions and corporate deductions. Why do why you think that's? Well, I think it goes back to my answer about small businesses. Uh, I, I don't know how you could yeah, deny individuals the deduction for state and local taxes and at the same time permit corporate taxpayers to deduct those items. I, I, I just think it's not a politically viable solution. Thank you very much. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Paulson, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this actually is a very, very good hearing and heard from another of folks back home. Uh, I, I, I want to follow up on what Mr. Mr. Davis was actually asking because uh, when the President came out with his budget proposal, I think it was last fiscal year's budget proposal just a year ago, he actually re recommended that cap, you know, at the 28 percent level for that exclusion on municipal bond or, you know, state and local bond deductions. And I'm curious, what would be the effect, you know, aside from the trade offs of the policy issue we've been having about whether you allow it or don't allow it, what would be the effect if that was reinstated? that that policy went forward as a part of, you know, a budget plan this year or next year in the near term. What's the average length of these bonds that are let out right now? Is it 20 years? Is it 30 years? Um, what is the effect of these sort of these existing contracts that are in the market right now? Um, what would be the effect versus, you know, it, 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 it phasing it in or not phasing it in? I'm just sure, you know, in terms of the actual, it's more of a technical question, but what, what, what happens specifically within the market? Um, Mr. Parkers. Some of the estimates that I've seen, I think they're rather conservative depending upon the percentage um, uh, cap you're talking about, or anywhere, as I said earlier, from uh, uh, 60, six tenths of a point to you know, one and a half uh, points in a bump up in your yield. You're back to the key issue here, which is risk and, and certainty. And, and obviously, investors are uh, looking for low risk and high certainty. Uh, when you're talking about any type, just, just, just as Mr. Buckley said, the mere fact that uh, this hearing is being held today is creating uncertainty in the market about what changes may happen, and that's going to have an impact on the market uh, going, going forward. Yeah. Mr. Taylor? Yes, let me uh, kindly point out that this focus in on ca capping individual interest rates, or uh, the deduction for state and local income t um, interest, is really looking at the problem the wrong way. If your concern, and Mr. Davis's concern, Mr. Marchant's concern, is for financing infrastructure, you should be looking at ways in which to expand the market of potential investors. And right now, because tax exemption exists for the interest on, on state and local bonds, you're limiting it to people who are in, by definition, higher income tax brackets. I think everyone who's ever been in the market, and one of the reasons BABs were somewhat, very, from my vantage point, very successful, was because it suddenly expanded the number of potential investors. What that does is eventually lower interest rates for people, means the federal subsidy is a little lower. Uh, that sort of thing is what you should be looking at, from my vantage point as an economist, and looking at markets, rather than the reverse. Mr. Buckley is absolutely right. In 1986, when tax reform was going through, the market froze because of discussions about how you should tax individuals. Yeah, Mr. Hodge, maybe you can comment. I mean, I, obviously we got uncertainty in the marketplace for, on the health care law right now that is uh, not giving predictability to the business community. But, I mean, just give a perspective of what the existing market would be like if, from a bond transition. And, well, I, have to, I think we have to be very careful about overdoing the uncertainty element. Yeah. That would mean that we would never talk about tax reform, because right. somebody might be uncertain. 
Uh, well, let's look at the certainty here, and that is state and local governments this year are spending $120 billion a year on the interest on their debt, their accumulated debt. That's more than they spend on police protection, twice as much as what they spend on parks and recreation, uh, twice as much as they spend on sewerage, uh, on, on fire protection, et cetera. They have loaded themselves with debt to the, ex to, 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 um, the detriment of other elements of their budget. So while they're crying uh, um, poor and poverty now that they can't afford to do certain things, a lot of it is just because they're crowding out their own budgets with the amount of debt that they've taken on. That's not our fault, but it can be attributed to the municipal bond exemption, which affords them the opportunity to overborrow and thus crowd out the things that they think are most important. Yeah, okay. Mr. Parker. Just a quick note on that. Uh, the, the, I can't speak to the uh, interest amount, but I can tell you that uh, uh, the current outstanding bond market is $3.7 trillion. So uh, again, the leverage ratio is pretty good. Okay, that's good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Doc McDermott, you're recognized. I, I said McDermott, I think. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Um, <clears throat> I'm listening to this whole thing, and, and Mr. Buckley, you tell me that Seattle uh, has a higher tax rate or pays higher tax than other places in the state of Washington. And that's true because we do these bonds for housing and all sorts of things in the city, and we tax ourselves for them. Uh, and it seems that what, what I'm, I'm having trouble figuring out what the upside of getting rid of municipal bonds is. Um, because all I hear is Mr. Hodge who says that, well, we'll get, we'll get a smaller government out of this and people will they'll do it with their own money or something. I'm not, I'm trying to figure out does the federal government that have this pot of money which we dole out or we bring back earmarks so that we can get certain money or since we're not using the tax exempt status and let the local areas do their own thing, then I guess we got to come here and try and get some earmarks back. Is that, or how are we going to get the infrastructure built is really what I'm, what I'm having a hard time. I hear the BABs are good, all three of you. Right. Mr. Parkers, Mr. Taylor, Mr. Buckley. Right. You all say they're good, right? It's a better way to do it than to do it as you're currently doing it. I, I want to at least be clear that what governors would support is an all-the-above strategy. Uh, building activity bonds together with the existing tax exempts need to be part of the toolkit, not looking to substitute for the existing market. And, and, and let me also agree. I, I think Build America bonds are a complement to tax exemption. It makes, it, it, it gives the issuer a choice and it does make, even for the issuers that choose to use traditional tax exemption, it means that they will receive much more of the federal revenue cost because it makes the whole market more uh, efficient. So taking, getting rid of the tax exempt municipal bonds, the only upside is that we would then have some money we could use to make a revenue neutral reduction in rate on corporations to 25 percent. Is that correct? That, that's essentially the debate that this committee is having, is, is do you repeal these more targeted tax benefits to finance rate reductions? And, and this is where I will continue to disagree with, with Mr. Hodge. They're the only economic benefits that can come from repealing the exemption are based on the fact that this country will be better off with less public infrastructure. And I would argue our problem is inadequate public infrastructure. And if you don't subsidize infrastructure this way, which has no earmarks, no federal involvement, basically, you will, have, you will be forced to find another way. We'll be forced back to our old habits of appropriated earmarks. Funds. Appropriated <laughs> funds. If I might, um, you are right in some ways in saying there is no federal involvement in the initial decision to, of, of what infrastructure projects go forward and the like. And while I subscribe and agree with that, 
the fact of the matter is by issuing tax-exempt bonds, you create the possibility of arbitrage on the part of the issuer. And as I tried to lay out in my prepared statement, that has led to a significant amount of abuse. And so if the committee wants to do what you've su suggested, Mr. Buckley, which is have both, then I think you have to look at solutions to dealing with the arbitrage, forcing issuers to invest in state and local government securities at the Treasury rather than having it done in the free market, or some other steps to maintain the integrity of that market. I, I don't disagree that there have been problems in the tax exempt bonds. I mean, that is clear. That, that means that this committee should take targeted responses, and, and perhaps what you just suggested is the right response to those abuses. You should not let the abuses, nor the New York Times article, to be used as an excuse to eliminate a fairly valuable support for local and state investment in infrastructure. That, I think, is sort of like medicine. You can find an individual case, one place or another, of a problem, but that really doesn't deal with the fact you have to deal with all the people. And when you're looking, I mean, you, you talk about a significant amount of abuse. Could you put a number around that? Are you saying 2% or 25% or 50% is abuse? I, I will let, I, I think it's de minimis, but I will let. Well, I, I, I think it's all in the, in the eye of the beholder. Personally, uh, where financial firms have paid since 1986 almost uh, a billion dollars in fines and penalties for abusing the arbitrage restrictions, engaging in collusion, uh, pay-to-play schemes, and the like in order to take advantage of this, that to me is not the right way to promote you know, national infrastructure programs or, or make this uh, a healthy market. That's, in fact, why I was very strong in my remarks about supporting BABs, because it does weigh with all of those potentialities. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Reed, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. McDermott, for the attempt at courtesy, but you were here first, so I appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I found this conversation very interesting uh, as a former mayor and now a member of Congress, and I've seen firsthand uh, the benefits of municipal financing and municipal investments through uh, local and state uh, uh, capital bonds. Uh, and Mr. Hodge, I want to give you an opportunity uh, because I think you're eager to have that opportunity. Um, in response to Mr. Buckley's conclusion uh, that what this will lead to uh, by removing this ex exclusion is less of an investment in infrastructure. Uh, because I think we have broad support that our infrastructure needs are significant. They need to be made in America, our investments there. And so I want to have, give you an opportunity to directly respond uh, to Mr. Buckley's conclusion uh, that you're in error. Sure. I think we have to be very careful about being sort of one column accountants here. And what we hear a lot of is just the benefits of these particular programs. We hear none of the downside. Um, and I, I think that equalizing the, the financing of a public uh, infrastructure and a private investment will lead to uh, a better economy in the long run. I don't think that the person who wants to borrow money in order to invest in a new factory should have to compete with a local community that wants to borrow the same amount of money in order to build a sports stadium. I don't think that that leads to positive outcomes in the economy. I think it leads to a negative. Uh, and as the economic research uh, shows very clearly, it shows it uh, leads to over borrowing, overspending, and ultimately overtaxing at the local level. And I think in, to turn that around, we need to equalize the treatment of, of the borrowing costs for both private borrowers and the public. And that way you get the, the best economic efficiencies and you get an equal rationalization of these kinds of investments. An equal trade-off in the, or the balance uh, between um, uh, public investment and private investment. But, but to follow up on that, though, d would that still provide adequate financing for the necessary infrastructure? Because you touch on a thing when you reference the sports stadium, because one thing I'm hearing in this conversation is, uh, and potentially on the abuses and in the written material that I read, is, is, is there an issue of definition of infrastructure? Because as a mayor, uh, when I was dealing with issues of water system replacements, sewage uh, replacements, there was no way I was going to be able to pay for that 
uh, based on my tax revenue coming in. I had to have a capital plan 20, 30 years out. And part of that capital plan was not only the year-to-year -year tax revenue that was coming in, but it was also the leveraging of the dollar that I could get from the municipal financing market to, to build that capital. And a lot of these projects, as you know, are not one-year projects. They're 30, 20-year projects. So would, would your proposal uh, still allow for an, an adequate funding stream for, for local, I'm really talking about local, not so much on the state, local and county level to, to do the necessary investments that our infrastructure demands outside of sports stadiums and all that, because I do believe there's a question of what is the definition of a, a qualifying infrastructure that, that's worthwhile to take a look right. at. But get beyond that, do you, do you still see that you'd have the revenue streams coming in? Well, I'm not saying that local governments shouldn't be able to borrow for the long term. Uh, absolutely not. They should just pay the same interest rate as a company that wants to build a wafer fabrication plant or a uh, pharmaceutical plant or some other sort of private investment that's also going to have a huge impact on a local community. Uh, those, dis those, those rates should be the same. There shouldn't be a, 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 a subsidy, an interest rate subsidy for the, pri for the public just simply because it's public. Does anybody, Ms. Parker, please. Congressman, I'm struck by your uh, remarks because I think you're inviting a subsequent discussion about uh, questions around public-private partnerships as an innovative tool to finance. Uh, I think that your conversation lends to a great discussion because there's a great model here of outcome-based value for money analysis where the public sector is looking to get, it, get something built, but they don't have the front-end capital to do it. Private sector is looking for a stable revenue stream in the long term, and the way, for instance, uh, in the UK, how this has uh, uh, been perceived. And let me be clear: in the UK, when you're looking at public-private partnerships, or as they're calling it, uh, public finance uh, too, going forward here, that's only 10 percent of their finance. So it's back to the argument that I've made about everything needs to be uh, in the toolkit that's available here. But you're looking at a situation where. Uh, the public-private partnership provides for front-end capital for the construction costs that the private entity is contributing. The public sector, in your case, your home community, doesn't pay a dime until that infrastructure is online and it meets all of the obligations and outcomes that you, as one of the parties negotiating this deal, expect. Then going forward, you have a long-term uh, relationship with the uh, uh, operator where the uh, local government or community or state is paying, uh, you know, regular um, uh, operational costs going forward. So it's an interesting option that I think uh, would, would really benefit this discussion going forward. I appreciate that. My time has expired. I yield back. That was a great closing comment. Thank you all. I know you recognize the problems down at the local level, and uh, I hope we do too. This is a difficult program that we're Em embarking on, and I uh, thank you for your help. Each and every one of you made good comments. Thank you for being here. The committee stands adjourned. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Johnson. You. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> we'll see you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.